that's going on the intro. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, it is. <laughs> no, you cannot put that on the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Fringe Youth Worker Podcast with TJ and Sunny. Hello and welcome to the Fringe Youth Worker Podcast. My name is TJ McConaughey and I am joined as always by my balding friend, my balding best friend, Sunny Saltalamakia. Sunny, what's real? Oh, hey, hey, T, how you doing? I was, uh, I was just, um, 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 weightlifting. <laughs> uh, I, love how you, I love how you just came in like, oh, we haven't been talking for the last hour and a half before the store started. Oh, hey, hey, how you doing, yeah, man? Hey, hey, how's What's going, going, how's going on? on? How, are, going? how are things how are right things? now? It's been a long yeah. time. Been a long time. Yeah, episode yeah. 14, one four. The wow. Uno Quattro, we've uh, transcended all the other lames who never made it past 14 podcast episodes, and uh, wow. I guess 13, because this is 14 now, and yeah. uh, moving forward. Hopefully one day we'll be more popular than Ninja on Twitch. <laughs> That's not going to happen That's for us. That's my goal for this uh, podcast. Unfortunately. Um, but uh, no, I'm excited. 14 episodes. Who would have thought a couple Yahoos would make it to 14 here? And what, what, The more impressive thing for me is the fact that there are 14 hours of you and I talking on the internet. 14, 14 plus hours of me and you talking on the internet. That's got to be purgatory for somebody. That's, like, you that's know. a lot. Yes. Yeah. That's a lot of talking between I think me 14 and hours of us talking on the internet equals hundreds of people who now get it and have much more empathy for our wives. <laughs> That's what I think it equates to. <laughs> we've, we've, uh, yeah, yeah, we've made a bunch of people feel really sorry for the people who married we us. We have that's, proven that's that we outkicked our coverage when we got married. That is, that is true. That is true. We did outkick our coverage forever. That will be true about me and you. All right. Well, Sonny, what do we uh, what do we got going on this week? What, what's going on with the show this week? Special episode, special format. Uh, only going to be two segments this week. Number what? one will be everyone's favorite, Tales from the Fringe. Tales from the Fringe. And stay tuned. TJ, because we might start asking the randos for tales from their fringe and uh, move on from there. And then yeah, after that, cool. we're going to do an interview. Uh, I believe it's with uh, a guy from Next Step, Jake from Next Step Ministries, talking about uh, Jake ministry. from State Farms. No, no, Jake, Jake from, from Next Farms. Step. Jake from yeah. uh, Olivia Pope, Jake uh, from Scandal. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll be talking about ministering to special needs kids and kind of the uniqueness uh, around that. So we'll do Tales from the Fringe. Play the interview, and then uh, we'll come back in, and we'll talk about the interview after the fact, and then uh, that'll be it, man. That's the end of the show. Well, that's awesome, Sonny. Uh, I'm is it awesome, dope. TJ? It's so awesome. So and awesome. It, and I and I'm Something super like excited. That. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'm ready, man. I I don't need no more chit chat. Let's uh let's get to the show. To the show. Join the conversation on Facebook and Instagram. And when you subscribe to this podcast, please leave us a five-star rating. We desperately need your approval. Tales from the Fringe. Tales from the Fringe, everybody's favorite segment. We're, we're bringing it right out the gates these days. We're going to lead with it just like it's a sermon. You're going to hear the stories first and foremost here on uh, on the Fringe Youth Worker podcast, this is the section where we do some good old fashioned storytelling. Uh, we look back on our, our lives and our work in ministry, and we bring you the raw format, the raw format uh, stories, so that you can uh, you can know what it's like or what it's been like for Sunny and I to work with fringe students and, and actually be fringe students ourselves. Um, Sonny, since I intro this segment, I then pass the mic to you and say, go ahead and tell us your, your, your fringe story this week. Okay. This one is very short. It's not so sweet, but it's kind of funny. Okay. Uh, so one day early on in my career as a uh, drug and alcohol counselor, I'm leading a group and the group is like, 
I'd say it's probably 20 heads in the room. It was kind of a big group. And I'm doing, you know, a group, group session, do these every single day. You do a check-in, you do a topic, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Except, you know, every kid in the group is mandated there by the court system. So obviously they want to be there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's after school. They're stuck in a room having to listen to me talk about, you know, why they shouldn't do drugs. It's a fascinating topic, right? Yeah. And, um, and 20 heads in a room is a lot. You know, they say the ideal... Ideal number for a group is like eight or six to eight is the ideal. So I had twenty. It's jam packed anyway. So this one kid's acting up, and um, and I I don't like to kick kids out of group. I haven't get to kicked a kid out of group in years. Um, but this one kid, this is early on early on in my career. He's uh he's starting to kind of act up. He's starting to kind of go crazy a little bit, and um, just kind of being disrespectful. Other people were talking. He's being disrespectful to them. So finally, I had to ask him to leave, and um, I asked him once really nicely. I said, hey, you know, maybe this isn't the day for you. I'll go ahead and give you credit for group, but I'm just going to ask you to, to go ahead and, 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 uh, and leave. So I asked him once, he doesn't listen. And um, so I say, all right, I'm just going to keep rolling through it and see what happens, you know. But then he keeps up. So then I finally have to get a little more stern with him, and I say, hey, um, you, you need to leave group, and you need to leave now. And, um, you know, if you don't want to do that, then we can you know, look at some other ways to have you – leave you know implying that i was gonna call his po or something like that so then uh so then he's all pissed off at me and uh and then he gets up and as he's walking out the door you know he's 14 years old so he's not gonna go quietly and uh he has to make an example out of me tj so uh in front of all the kids right in the middle of the group he goes f you fat a <laughs> Except he didn't <laughs> say the the letters, he spoke yeah. it out. He goes, mm -hmm. F you fat A, fat fat butt, so to say, right? So everybody starts laughing. And then all of a sudden everybody looks over to me and like, what are you gonna do now, Sonny? He just totally called you out. And he's still yeah. standing there at the door. And you know, a number of things went through my head, you know, charging him, uh, not charging him like an assault, <laughs> but charging at him and punching him, charging yeah. and choking him, charging, you know, doing a bunch of things. Uh but I simply smiled. I rubbed my big belly that he was insinuating was fat. And I said, thank you. My wife is a great cook. And then, uh, and then everybody started laughing. And they're like, oh, that was money. That was money. And then he got mad because he didn't get what he wanted out of that. And then he stormed out of the room. Everybody was like, dude, you owned him. You owned him, bro. You owned him. And then I finished group. And, and that was actually the last time I ever seen that kid for a couple of years. And I randomly seen him at a basketball game years later. And uh, he actually apologized for that. It was pretty funny. So moral of the story is, you know, kill him with kindness, roll through resistance. In, in counseling, they have a phrase in motivational interviewing called rolling through resistance. And if a kid has nothing to fight against, then there's nothing to fight against and their anger or frustration often will, will cease. And so rather than come at him with something that I really wanted to, first thought, wrong thought kind of thinking, I simply diffused it with humor, kind of owned him in the process, and then he walked out and, uh, and group was salvaged and uh, everybody moved on. But, you know, when you work with kids from the fringe, sometimes they're a little disrespectful and they're rude and stuff like that, and you can't get caught up in that. you gotta, you got to power through those and not let, you know, your – lower thinking self get a hold of you and all that kind of jazz so anyway yeah man awesome Stuff awesome like awesome story uh super excited for you sonny thanks bro yeah and this keeps coming back up is that the idea of rolling with resistance um uh if you are going to work with students who are on the fringes of society you're going to have to be uh resilient that's just going to have to be something that you are. And if you're not that way, if you have a quick fuse, if you, if you can't uh, not sweat the petty things, then you're not going to have a very long career in this because this thing takes patience. This thing takes tenacity. This thing takes resilience. So my story uh, is actually a college story. And uh, like I've said before on this episode, you'll hear in Tales from the Fringe sometimes stories about students we know and sometimes about 
uh, us and us growing up. Uh, I had become a Christian about three or four years before I showed up on a college campus, um, and I was studying youth ministry in the Bible at Multnomah, and it was a uh, it was a really awesome experience. But I still had so much fringiness to me. That's just who I was as a person. Uh, God was not done with me yet, Sonny. That's, that, that's, that's, that's the Christian way of saying something, right? God's not done with me yet, you know? <laughs> and that's kind of where I was at uh, there. Uh, and so uh, I got elected in my second year to be an RA. And I still to this day don't know how I got elected to be put on that team because, again, I was I was pretty uh, risque as a Bible college student. I wasn't your prototypical Bible college student. And um, one of the things that I did, Sonny, uh, on the campus there is we had to have these uh, all dorm section meetings and uh, and that meant that not all dorm sections but just dorm section meetings with our with our students who were living in our hall. So uh, I had my group and it was kind of like a little small group that I had. And, uh, and we met and I wanted to spice up our meeting times because I didn't want to just call it, you know, dorm section meeting day, you know? So I started searching for other, other things to call this thing, Sonny. And so I, the first thing I got, cause you know, we were all male dorm. The first place I went was to the, my lowest self and I called them, uh, sausage fest, <laughs> And I had all of our students uh, uh, send a, bring in sausage and brats, and we would cook them right before we'd have our meeting, and we'd all eat sausages as we had our, you know, all men's dorm section meeting. I got told by uh, head RA at that point that was probably not an appropriate thing to call my dorm section meeting. Which now, now I can, now I completely understand why. Was it at okay, that now point I get they it. questioned having you be the RA? I, you know what? I think that the day that they let me be the RA <laughs> was the day they started questioning that whole thing, right? Like, I just think that, yeah, I think that I, I wasn't, yeah, I didn't give out any, any, any like uh, campuses, which was their highest rank of punishment. I didn't do any of that stuff. Anyway, um, uh, so I had to change the name and I was like, what am I going to call this thing, right? It was always on a Friday. And so, I, I was at this garage sale. It was right across the street from our campus. And I found this like spaceship looking kitchen utility, uh, kitchen appliance, right? And I'm like, what is this? And they said, that is a portable deep fryer. And I go, yes, it is. And, and I will buy it from you because I think it was like five bucks. And so I gave them the money. And I didn't even know what I was going to do with this deep fryer. So I had no idea what I was going to do with this deep fryer. But I had a pretty good idea that it was going to be incorporated into my dorm section meetings. And so I took it, brought it back, I got some oil, and I realized, and, and I didn't know the rules because I was an RA, that I wasn't allowed to have heating devices in your dorm. Like, this is a good way to burn down the dorm. So you're not allowed to have the, the deep fryer in your room deep frying. And so the only two places in the dorm that you could have heating devices were one in the kitchen, but that was kind of in the main lobby area, and it'd be really hard to have a dorm section meeting in that room. Like it just there would be so many randos around and it just wouldn't have the feel that I wanted. The other place that you could have a heating device uh, was in the bathroom. So uh, the bathroom was right across the, was right across the hall from our dorm section. It was like just literally right there, Sonny. And uh, and so I thought, yeah, this is this is what's gonna happen. Every Friday we're gonna have deep Fridays, and uh, and and deep Fridays meant you bring whatever you want, and we will deep fry it. We will talk about Jesus and our campus policies. And we will deep fry anything you bring. Um, and these meetings will all take place in the men's bathroom upstairs. <laughs> 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 and we did, man. We circled up chairs in the men's bathroom and we deep fried things like every, every, I think it was the third Friday of every month until they, they shut us down. And eventually we got shut down because people got tired of smelling like French fries after they got out of the shower, uh, <laughs> we had guys that, you know, they came in like these were at night. These were literally in like, like 11 o'clock. We had guys come in to take their shower and they would, they would just shower while we were just meeting in the bathroom. Good witness so, opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, 
it was another reason why I should have never been an RA. And, uh, and so the next year in the student handbook, Sonny, uh, they, they specifically said you are not allowed to have any kitchen use items <laughs> in the bathrooms. And, and that is a policy that is still in place at Multnomah to this day because, because they say every they, rule comes from somewhere. It comes from somewhere, and I was the dummy that created that rule. So uh, that was a, that's a story of me being a fringe resident assistant at a Bible college, um, and that and that you know put me on the map. I mean, I'm I'm not going to be like accepting any like alumni of the ward a year, uh, alum, alumni, alumni of the, of the year. ward a year. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really what you just said? Alumni? Of the- I don't know, man. I'm having trouble speaking today because I think uh, I'm just slowly having a stroke over here, man. <laughs> I don't know what the heck's going on with my brain right now. Uh, I know what it is. It's the youth pastor diet. I got all back on my horse and I'm going crazy and ugh, and my brain is a little bit behind. Anyway, I'm not going to be accepting any alumni of the year award at Multnomah anytime soon, but that student handbook still has a rule that was basically authored by my fringiness. So that's awesome. Now, now here's the question. Was it effective? Oh yeah, dude! It was totally effective. It was it was the talk of the dorms, dude. Everybody wanted to be in my dorm section mm-hmm. after that. Mm-hmm. We had um, dude. We and actually, dude, we actually figured out how to deep fry things. That was the other part of the story that I didn't say. Yeah. Is like at yeah. first we were just like throwing things in there, but then we actually started getting recipes. We did like deep fried Oreos. We ended up figuring out how to do deep fried ice yeah, cream, yeah. and it was amazing. It was so so good. And we had the randos coming in, like, hey, can we have some of those stuff? Mm-hmm. And we're like, hey, we're having a meeting here, okay? So mm-hmm. you need. And to I, and take, I think a, take a shower, take a dump, or leave. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sacred ground, okay? We're talking about Jesus in here. Uh, but I think that, I just discovered the name of this episode. Take a shower, take a dump, or leave. <laughs> take a shower, take a dump, or leave. Uh, but that, I think, is always the, the... I'm writing down the name of the show. Um, yeah. You can be effective numerous different ways, and you, you, and you can do the same thing other people do but if you're creative with it then you can start like then it attracts itself like you don't have to advertise a ministry that's effective if you're doing it the right way you know like the kids will advertise it for you or the people coming will advertise it for you and stuff like that um yeah the other day i had a kid come in and uh he made reference to like hey you know so and so one of the kids that won the music contest they go yeah he goes man i want to be like him he came here huh and i was like yes he did and so like you know the kids are your best advertisement, I've always thought. Like, you don't need to spend money on anything or, or really even have social media presence. If you're being effective with the kids in a fun, creative way and they're getting something out of it, they will advertise it for you and they will bring their friends and the thing will spread. And then next thing you know, it's, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be happening or popping or whatever you want to refer to it as, you know? <laughs> right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah. You get them yeah, talking. It's get them be... talking about it. And you, can, and you can do a Bible study in a living room or in a bathroom, deep frying Oreos. Yep. Yep. And seriously, man, I mean, again, think think outside of the box. Uh, you know, different objects come into your life. The Lord brings them in there. And uh, God gave me that deep fryer for a reason. There you, you know? go. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, and I guarantee you, man, none of those, none of my dorm section people have forgotten deep Fridays. None of them. So. Hi, right, TJ. Uh, we got an interview this week. An interview. Uh, his name is Jake, and I'm going to let you intro that because you interviewed him, and then we'll go from there. So I'm interviewing my friend Jake Holman from Next Step Ministries. Uh, Next Step is a awesome organization. Um, we used them last year for our short short term mission trip needs, and they're awesome. Um, just a a Awesome recommendation you can get from me. They, they'll handle the whole trip, and their people are well-trained and professional and awesome. So if you're looking for everything trip, um, all kind of inclusive kind of mission trip, Next Step is should be who you're calling next. Um, however, we are not talking about Next Step today um, because uh, it was actually on the Next Step 
uh, trip that I started having a conversation with Jake about something that was sat right in the middle of his heart, and that is the idea of special needs ministries, um, something I really hadn't thought of before. But uh, I realized after that conversation that this is a conversation that more youth ministers and ministers in general should be having. And so uh, I wanted Jake to come on the show and sort of answer some questions around this. My first question, that for, uh, my first question Jake, is this. Why special needs ministry? Why is that such an important part of your heart? Yeah, thanks, TJ. Uh, thanks for the plug, too. I feel almost like I have to pay you now. Uh, for, for the plug and, and I'm glad that, uh, we were able to save the third podcast for the last. Usually that's the best one, right? Um, so why special yeah, I, needs ministry for, for me, um, my life changed nine years ago. Um, uh, even actually even before that, my wife and I, uh, had decided, uh, to, we got married. Um, we both have been divorced in the past with one child each and we decided to, Hey, we wanted to do a family together um, and have uh, kids of our own. And so uh, we, uh, we when when I say we, it's really her that she got she got pregnant. Three months into that pregnancy, um, we had a miscarriage, and that was pretty tough on us. And and I wouldn't call us uh, believers at the time, but um, that kind of uh, laid out a path for us. Um, and looking back, it definitely helped us make decisions as we had faced them coming up with um, our son that was born nine years ago, Aiden, um, and he was born with Down syndrome. And uh, through the first trimester of, of Aiden being um, cooked in Michelle's belly, uh, he we found out that he might be high risk for a cognitive disorder. Didn't know really what that meant um, for us, but hmm. um, it kind of like put it really sat uneasy with Michelle during the entire pregnancy it wasn't enough of a risk for me to even kind of concern or uh, lose guys are oblivious, but even to consider it as a worry. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we sped up and, and, uh, and he was born with Down syndrome and uh, just the wow. ignorance level of not even knowing what Down syndrome was at the time. I remember Googling it from the hospital and there's a lot of things that the doctors tell you not to do with Google and, trying to fi figure out your own diagnoses uh, of things that are going wrong with you. Like I've got cancer just about every day when I stub my toe and I <laughs> Google it. And so this was very similar to that. Like we Googled it and uh, we really felt like our life as, uh, as a couple what had this, had this different trajectory, sad trajectory at the time and really made it hard. And so, um, as we've definitely grown, um, uh, God has shown us the ways he's using Aiden in our lives and the lives of others for advocacy or just how to love kids that aren't, that don't look like you and I and, and, yeah. and maybe behave a different way and, and understand that's okay and that's, that's normal. And so as he gotten in, he got into school, like we started learning and seeing like the biggest differences. Like we do um, school events and we'd see his ability um, amongst his peers, and we thought he was fine. Like hey, he's he's progressing, he's learning, he's talking, and but it, until you get him in front of his peers, we know we noticed that there was a gap. Um, and so you know, being in third grade now, we definitely see that there's a big gap, and um, it's almost like his peers embrace him more than the adults do uh the adults um wow. just have a hard time with it you know they uh, you know a lot of times uh don't know if they should say sorry or how the mixed emotions are it's you know when yeah. somebody passes you don't know how to how to say something and that would be meaningful and so people just we've heard a lot of different comments about along the way and it's just hard and so um, it's really, it's really, uh, it's been a really hard but eye-opening track for me is, is that school has been more of an inclusive, welcoming um, area than our church. And, and wow. I'm not naming just one church. We've, we've tried several churches and um, hmm. that's the hard part. It's like when you, when we feel like everyone's made in God's image, and then you see um, how they respond. And I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers and I'm not saying 
that they're they should be they should be doing x y and z it's just i would love for a person to walk through a church door and i think a lot of a lot of our listeners and and a lot of people that you talk in the church leadership want that image of like we want the broken walking in through our door and the minute somebody yeah. with special needs comes through their door it's like oh we don't we don't know how to handle how to handle that so yeah. It's yeah. definitely it's it's been a conversation uh, of mine. I'm more of that you know fifty thousand foot kind of view guy. So I'm yeah. I'm the solutions guy. I'm wired to to fix, which has been a really eye opener for me because you can't fix Down syndrome. It's not contagious. Yeah. Um, it's huh. not fixable. Uh, uh, but it's helped me kind of navigate that. But it's still you know when it comes to in, including kids with with special needs, um, it is it is something that I, I feel like fixing is advocacy. And so that's kind of like yeah. right where it's at for me right now in my life. Yeah. So you have this – so you and your wife get together. It's a blended family. Um, and you guys decide, hey, we're going to have another kid. And that goes on to a miscarriage and then – um, and then you have that kid, um, and he is born with a uh, disability, Down syndrome, and uh, and that rocks your world. That changes your outlook on world, your world, and it just changed your trajectory at that point. Um, what you saw in life um, kind of all goes through that lens of Down syndrome, or at least a parent. Um, a parent uh, with a student with Down syndrome, and and that that type of thing is something that not a whole lot of people have to go through, but more and more people have to go through it. And you said something really interesting um, that the schools um, you found them a lot more welcoming and a lot more prepared than the churches. And I honestly think this is a a thing that the church should do. I mean, we aren't living up to our calling if someone can walk through the door that's too broken for a church. Um, and so I honestly think, and because I've been a minister for, for 12 years and I've been to a lot of staff meetings, I don't think, and this is crazy because I've worked at some, some bigger churches. I don't think we've ever had a discussion around what do we do with special needs? And, and that's crazy to me. And, and that's one of the things that came out when me and you had that conversation down in Houston. Um, and so, uh, I want to ask you, why aren't churches having this discussion? I think I I think the biggest thing, and I don't I don't say this to be mean or that it's not been a topic, but ignorance is the biggest. I, big, I guess I would say ignorance and a fear um, going into it. So, and when I mean ignorance, it's like I was totally ignorant to what it meant to have a child with Down syndrome. Like, you know, I I had grown up in high school. I I had had a couple friends that had Down syndrome. And they were always the kids like, hey, we hung around. They were cool, um, but they they did their own thing. Like they went to their own classrooms. And and now it's like we've we've changed as a society that we don't we don't send them to their own rooms. We in, in, we're inclusive to allow them to be with um, specifically Aiden's peers, and they embrace them. And so I feel like that ignorance level is like just not knowing how to include kids with special needs and then the understanding uh, and, and then the fear of not doing it right. Like I think we all go into ministry thinking that it's like we can do it really well and then realize that like, gosh, I'm going to fall short on this or I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, even you, when we were in Houston, um, not, not having a conversation like that's never, that's never come up. And, and that's okay. Like, I, I love the idea of it not coming up. But I think it's just, you know, we go into the reasons of why we aren't doing it. Like, we don't have the capacity or it's going to cost a lot for us to equip our church to do it. Um, yeah. We come up with a list of the things that won't work instead of really uh, coming up with a list that is going to work. Like, what would it look like? Um, I mean, everyone that comes in the door is broken. Um, yeah. These these kids that are coming in the door are no less broken than we are, uh, or more broken. But they're just in a different trajectory. And I I personally think that I can reach so many people out there. Like TJ, you can reach so many people. Your viewers can reach so many people. But uh, like my son Aiden, if he is sold out for Jesus, 
he is going to be able to reach kids that I won't be able to, that you won't be able to. And so I think it's really, it's really important to, like, let's get rid of our fears about why it won't work and really kind of focus on why it will. Uh, I love that you, sp- you spoke to fear there. Um, oftentimes when I'm working with parents and, and actually parents have become a pretty, a pretty big majority of our listeners to this show. Um, the, the, oftentimes the discussions I have with them about what they do and don't want for their kids, and this has nothing to do with special needs. It almost always rotates around fear and fear oftentimes dictates what we don't do. Like you said, more than uh, motivating us to do something proactively. And so we end up doing nothing. And if you end up doing nothing, then you don't really help at all. You don't really help at all. Um, and and re- one of the reasons I wanted to have you specifically on the show, because I know your heart, your heart, this, this is an issue that's right in the middle of your heart. And, um, and so I wanted to I wanted to have you speak to youth pastors or youth workers in general, and I wanted you to be able to say, um, here's some strategies, here's some things that might work. Now, keep in mind, most youth groups exist under 20 people, and they, ex- and then they exist in smaller contexts. I think that sometimes the bigger churches have more resource- resources, so you know there's a way to throw money at it or spend something. But what's a way that, in your opinion, that most youth workers can start this discussion with their teams and with their youth groups? That's a good question. I don't know if it's appropriate to argue with the host or disagree with the host, but um, oh, I've, yeah. I've come from a large church. And so, um, for instance, our Christmas um, services, we had just over 9,000 um, attendees for Christmas service. Wow. So obviously that's a lot for that service, um, for the services that they provided. But that's a church that in five years did not move any closer to um, meeting the needs of kids with special needs than the day that we had started the conversation. So I, I'm, I, I had that same idea of like, hey, a larger church has more people, more areas of, hey, you know, a thousand dollars going to um, set up area, an area is um, a penny in the bucket, if you will, to a smaller church. Um, and every, everything that I thought about a larger church was kind of like thrown out. Uh, huh. and, and us going, we actually go to a smaller church now. And it's funny because the first thing that we did when we walked in the door is like, we look lost, right? Like we're the, we don't like to bounce churches. This was the first time we changed churches and we walked in the door and, um, uh, there was a greeter, and I don't know if it was training. I don't know if it was uh, they the, their their real job during the day was in, in working with kids with special needs or has had that experience. But we felt welcomed, and so wow. I think I think the and you know I'm a I'm a church goer. I work in ministry, and for me to yeah. feel welcomed, I mean, gosh, it was like this weight on my shoulders had just like left and like expectations of I had a feeling of like, it'll be okay. And that's, I mean, there was very little said that the the verbal exchange between that was very little. It was just body language and the area that they had for us to sit in and talk with. And it's just like, it was overwhelming, like really get to a point where wow. like, what have I been missing for the last five years? Like, almost second guessing that why I hadn't made a, a different decision uh, five years ago. So I re- really would challenge that. I think the smaller churches probably have uh, a better way to, um, you know, move towards the direction of really supporting um, the kids with special needs and that, in that demographic. But and that surprises me. I mean, and, and frankly, that, that just that surprises me because, you know, you'd think that, you know, a school is good at this because they have specialists and and resources, honestly. Um, but it's crazy to think that you have a church here that's pulling nine thousand on Christmas, and it has 
no good answer for this. And, uh, and that, again, uh, that's, that's surprising, but it's also not surprising in the fact that, again, I've worked in churches for the last uh, 12 years. And like I said, it's just never come up as, as something we need to call, we need to do that. And so, and so, yeah, so you found a home in a little bit of a smaller church now, and you're finding more of a welcome in that. And, and so again, what is it that, what is it that, uh, that smaller churches, especially youth workers can do to, to make people with special needs feel welcome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, I certainly don't have a rule book written that says, you know, I wish I had it for parenting because I have four kids. Like, that would have been great. <laughs> so I don't necessarily have a rule book for this either. But I think the the biggest, the, the top ones, if you will, I mean, the first one would just be, like, how do you how do you greet anyone that comes through your doors? And, and you know, that includes um, a family with special needs. And uh, that's the that's the top one. Like, and then I, I my heart pours out for the empathy. Like, if we knew like every family that came in the door that wore their sins on their shoulders. Like, okay, I'm an alcoholic. I wear that across my chest. I'm an alcoholic. You would have empathy for that person for being an al alcoholic. Typically, with kids with special needs, you visually see um, a difference. And so, with a family coming in. I have empathy for that. Like, gosh, the, I want the child to to know Jesus, and I want the parents to have an hour or an hour and a half of respite. Um, it, it could be not even arguing for an hour and a half while they're listening to the word. Um, and so how do you create that environment? And I don't think you have to think of it like, okay, I have to have a special place, and I have to have highly trained um, people to work with them. I, you know, I think that you can look at your congregation and see that, like, okay, well, we have two or three parents um, that have kids with special needs or that work in the schools or occupational therapy or physical therapy that work with kids with special needs and really tap into them. As a, as a family, like, we love it when people ask, like, what can I do to make this area better or this situation better? And between my wife as an OT and me as a fixer, like, we embrace that. So I think asking questions, like, you don't need to know the answers, but asking the questions that that helps the conversation go. And the, from my experience in nine years, like, parents with kids with special needs, like, they're the most grace-filled um, demographic, if you will, um, because they just understand, like, they have to have grace when it comes to working with their kids. Like what worked two minutes ago to get my kid to put his shoes on doesn't work tomorrow to put his shoes on. And so we just share grace and, you know, in a different way. And so I really kind of like, you know, so the greeting at the front door is huge, but having the conversation, being proactive about it, like don't be reactive and having a, a parent come in and saying, Oh, that, yeah, I remember talking about this once. But what are we going to do now with it uh, and understand, like, we have to embrace them coming in. And so what does that look like? Um, and so then, two is, you know, have that conversation where you're meeting with, meeting with parents or meeting with professionals. I mean, go to a school and see if you can meet with their special education teacher to set up a time where you can just kind of brainstorm that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think just the conversation needs to be had. What does it look like for your church or your um, student ministry or just the kids that you work with to be included? I mean, we all have this urge and want and desire to be included in the things. And, and that's the biggest thing is how do we do that? love that you're using the word included. Um, I think that's one of the easiest things that oftentimes we all overlook is that, um, you know, maybe you don't have the, the people to, to make a, a full ministry around this. Well, then how do you welcome people with special needs to the, ta to the table? How do you say you are welcome here? And I think, that's, I think that's good that you're starting the conversation. The greeting has a lot to do with it. And, uh, and, and that's, I think those are good. I, I'll add this from the youth uh, worker side of things. Um, 
you know, if you're a parent out there and your and your kid has special needs, one of the best things you can do is work with the youth worker on those things. And I don't know how many times in my ministry career I've had parents drop off their student and it turns out that that student has some sort of disability and you have no idea what that disability is and it takes and so at first all you see is the behavior and uh and so you know you're not a pr- trained professional you're not someone who can bring diagnosis to this you can just see behavior and if you don't get a heads up about what that behavior is um sometimes you can miss huge opportunities to teach your group and to teach that student about how how do we include everyone who's here and uh and i know that sometimes as youth worker we get just so down the we get so down the road on just trying to fix behavior that we forget that what we're what we really should be doing is shaping culture and so um I, I've had in my past, Jake, I've had to stick my head into cars because a kid's been dropped off and I've never met their parents. Um, and there's obviously something going on there where I've had to just stick my head in their car and be like, hey, can we have a quick discussion? Um, because I'm seeing some things and I could use your help. And just this is the last question. Um, is there any like specific advice that you could give to um, parents who are struggling right now because their kid... Uh, Maybe doesn't have Down syndrome, but they're on the autism spectrum. Um, they're they're just their kid is different, and they have you know they're overwhelmed right now. Um, what 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 piece of advice or encouragement can you give to them? Um, I think uh, you know something that I didn't touch on uh, earlier was you know you look at, at, at I look at mi- special needs ministry kind of like in twofold is like the first is you're meeting um, the needs of of the student that coming in your door, but you're really giving mom and dad um, that time to just pause for a minute. And a lot of parents, including ourselves, like it's hard to find that time when your kid, when they're not in school, um, is is a hundred percent attention. You need to have that. So you you get to the point where the bus drops them off, or you're picking them up, and then. Um, you're, you're working with them and spending time with them and then you go to bed and you're just exhausted and then you hit the reset, uh, button for the next day. Um, I want, I want church to be a place that, um, these, these parents, uh, land and there, there is a, an ability to just like have a, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily like a labeled as a support group, but man, to talk about like my heart and, and finding um, families that have a kid with special needs, my heart uh, almost breaks for the families. Not that they're yeah. going through it, because I have learned so much with Aiden, and I won't change it. We've, in fact, like looked for adoption, and is that a way that we can help other kids with special needs? Like it's wow. a lot of work, but there, it's it's just like anything else in life. We're not wired to do it alone. And for us mm-hmm. to like bring people with it, with it, uh, um, and be able to pour into them and share like, gosh, it just sucks sometimes that we have to go through this. Like, you know, I've heard all the stories like, oh, God wouldn't have given you Aiden if you wouldn't have been able to handle it. Like, I can handle it, wow. but I certainly can get a lot better with Jesus in the center of it. But I yeah. need people around me to like vent to sometimes, like. Uh, when he was born, the first selfish thing that out of my, out of my, uh, I started in my head and I'm like, I feel, I feel vulnerable to say it out loud is like, I don't want my adult child to live with us the rest of our life. And so yeah. like, that's okay. That's okay to say. And that's okay to feel the feelings, um, and that you're not alone through it as well. So I think really kind of like you're, if you can really embrace I, uh, this, this idea of a special needs ministry and it doesn't, I, I feel like sometimes when you say special needs ministry, it's gotta be like, it's gotta be a binder and it's gotta have all these, these tabs behind it, uh, to know what we do in this situation and this situation. It's just simply embracing the child that comes in, but also having those conversations with the, the parents to like know they're going through the same things that typical parents go through, but it's just an mm-hmm. elevated level and gosh, just not to be, just not to do it alone is the biggest thing.
that's some good stuff right there. And uh, I love that we're having this discussion here. I hope this discussion uh, gets out to the right ears. And, um, and, and I love your heart for this stuff. It's obviously something that uh, came to you probably as a burden, but I, I, I think you've turned it into a blessing. And I think that's a really good thing to do. And, and uh, yeah, I just love that heart, man. Um, and, uh, yeah, I love the work that you're doing both, uh, both inside of your house and, um, and, and with next steps. So, uh, thanks Jake for joining us here on the fringe youth worker podcast. My pleasure. We are still listening to the fringe youth worker podcast. want to say thanks again to Jake Holman from Next Step Ministries. Uh, thanks for coming in and sharing your story and sharing your heart. That was a great interview, and I think it's a topic that a lot of people steer away from, but it is right in the middle of this idea that we have called fringe youth work. So, um, uh, anyway, Sonny, you heard my reaction. I got to actually talk to Jake, but I'm interested in your perspective, Sonny. You you work with a lot of mental illness and uh, kids with some some disabilities, well, I, and I, I wanted to know. hear you know your but, perspective uh, on uh, on Jake. I thought he said a lot of interesting things. Uh, the thing that stuck out to me the most right off the bat was um, <laughs> was it was it was very similar to celebrate recovery in a sense. Where, uh, oh gosh, what's the guy's name who started to celebrate? It's John something. Anyway, so John Baker. So John Baker started Celebrate Recovery. He was finding that when he went to church um, to support his, his, his not wanting to drink, all they wanted to talk about was Jesus. And then when he went to AA, uh, all they wanted to talk about was drinking, and he couldn't talk about Jesus because your higher power could be anything you wanted. And so he found there wasn't a happy medium to talk about both in a, in a setting that would be supportive of him. And so that's why he started Celebrate Recovery. And then now Celebrate Recovery obviously is, is one of the biggest, um, and Rick Warren says this, it's one of the biggest reasons Saddleback Church is as big as it is, is because it's a leadership factory. Um, Celebrate Recovery is because it, it just turns people out and, and then they're motivated for Jesus and motivated for the recovery. So, so what Jake said is that he had to, you know, he found more support in a school than he did for special needs than he did in the church. And I thought that was an interesting, interesting statement, you know, because, you know, you, you like to think that the church should be the, the end all be all for social justice and social yeah. outreach and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I don't know if it's, if it's fallen off or just some churches just don't do it anymore, but you know, social causes used to be the, the church's domain and, and now, now it's not. And um, so I thought that was an interesting thing that he had to go to, to kind of reach out to schools and talk to them. And then he talked about it at the end of the interview, too, about, you know, it's OK to meet with professionals and bring in professionals who who understand that more than you do as a church and have them help you, you know. Um, so I thought that was cool that he was he was promoting that and stuff like that, you know. And the other thing I thought that was um, a really good thing he said is is about um okay to okay to vent it's okay to be frustrated it's okay to be at your wits end um and you don't need somebody to say you know if god brought it to you he'll bring it through it like yeah we get that but sometimes you just need a place to vent and be frustrated and get it off your chest and be around other people who do and, and it made me think of that documentary uh stress portrait of a killer which i think is on netflix and it talks about that group of, of ladies who I believe had special needs kids, if I'm not mistaken, and, and they were stressed out and, and high strung because of all the, all the, you know, we all have kids, we have kids and we know the, the stresses of that. So a special needs kids just ramps that up, you know, 10 times. And how, how the women found support simply by, by spending time together once a week, whether, whether it was a play group or whether it was um, 
a talking supportive group, whether it was just having coffee. They they found a way to kind of just be together, share a, a shared experience that not a lot of people have, and then they felt comfort in that. And, and I think you can look at that model throughout human history, so to say, right? It's why AA works. It's why D groups work. It's why church works. It's why recovery works. It's people coming together with a shared experience and being able to talk and process through that shared experience to, together with people who understand them and can relate to them and show empathy, which was one, one of the big things that he said. It's, it's being empathetic towards another person's plight or, 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 or frustrations in life, so to say, without having to like feel this need of, of, well, you know, have you prayed enough or have you read your Bible enough or have you done this enough? Like sometimes just, just sit with the person, right? What does the Bible say about um, if a person's happy, rejoice with them. If they're sad, you know, be sad with them and stuff like that. Like, you know, I get the whole command to, to make disciples and all that, but sometimes it's just a matter of sitting arm in arm with somebody and letting them vent and letting them get the stuff off their chest. And, and so much of what I do um, in counseling is, is meeting with parents and letting parents do that. On Monday, I had a mom just basically cry for a half hour straight. And then, and then afterwards she was like, thank you. I, I just needed this time just to get all this stuff off my chest. And so, you know, I think the encouragement I had is, is, is keep, mm, keep yeah. showing empathy to those, you know, keep obviously keep supporting people and stuff like that, but pay attention to those parents who, who are struggling and stuff. Um, and I liked what you said about how sometimes parents, you know, they'll just they'll just show up to church, drop off their kid, and leave. And their kid's been a part of your youth ministry for two years, and you've had two conversations with them. You know, and, and, and in my line of work, I, I we see that all the time, and <clears throat> it's kind of like the whole like, hey, fix my kid. Yeah. You know, like, hey, I've had him for fifteen years, it ain't working, so you fix them. It's like, I can't do this by myself. We have to yeah. be better, I think, across the board as youth workers at partnering yeah. with parents to help help the situation at home and stuff like that cuz you know the parents are there far more than we will be, we mm. what we are and they'll be there longer than we will be as well and stuff so the more we can partner with parents the more we can you know have parent nights or um, even have a, a parent venting night you know you give them all a bunch of food and drinks and, and coffee and stuff like that you know tea and and not alcohol <laughs> but just let them come together and you know something we've been thinking about a while <laughs> <laughs> Something we've been thinking about for a while in our program is doing like a, um, that would a single help, mom's night out, and so like they they, they <laughs> come in, we give them dinner, um, you know, have you know tea and coffee and stuff like that, and just just let them have a night off with the kids. Mm-hmm. They could bring their kids. The kids would be in another room, um, playing playing games and stuff. But give the moms a chance to not have to cook dinner, to not have to clean up, to not have to worry about what their kids doing for a couple hours, and just have a chance to be mom, you know, or or not be mom be who they are, you know, outside of mom and stuff like that. And so, but again, that goes back to that empathy and, and yeah. just supporting people, you know? So, so that was cool. So I, I really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I think that the church wants the champions. Uh, and so sometimes we, we build our churches in such a way that it attracts healthy people. Um, but that's just so yeah. counterintuitive to the church that Jesus was dreaming up when he established this whole thing. Nope. And, you know, he, he, he said it, man. He said, uh, the healthy people don't need a doctor, you know? <laughs> um, and I think, you know, churches that exist on the fringes of society are doing the Lord's work. Um, Churches that, you know, have healthy and active celebrate recovery and AA models built into their church models. Churches who've asked the question of how are we going to minister to single moms? Uh, churches who've asked themselves, uh, you know, what, what are we going to do with special needs? And um, these are the questions mm-hmm. that if we don't ask, we will all just try to chase the holy huddle, you know? Um, and I think too many churches exist just as good places for Christians to go. And that's a problem. That's a, that's a problem because the church is supposed to be this radical mind, life altering thing. It's supposed to be the power of God to bring in the broken people of this world. And, and not, not, I don't want to diss all churches. In fact, I think I'm, I'm part of a pretty good one here, 
But at the same time, uh, I've been a part of too many places where it's like, man, are we really chasing the people who Jesus would have hung out with? Or are we existing in such a way that we're, we're going after people who look pretty clean and pretty healthy and pretty normal and maybe got a little bit of money you in know, their pocket? And at, the, at the same time, just, not every church is going to be equipped to handle special and, and needs. Helpful. Not every church is going to be equipped um, to handle the addictions. But I think the bigger question is, is, is what is your church no. doing in the context of of the city that your church is in to minister to those on the fringes of society in whatever capacity that is, homelessness, uh, it's race issues, whatever it is. Um, what's your church doing to reach out to those in the most need in your immediate area, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely true. And I think that's, you know, what you're talking about, the Sunny, is is every town has its own unique problem. And churches can be places where those problems can be answered. Not not completely like fixed or solved, but it could be a place where uh where these things are at least addressed. Um and uh one of the things that really attracted us to come into the church we're at is its involvement with foster care. Um, foster care is something I think the Lord's put on our hearts. We haven't jumped in completely yet. We're working through paperwork right now, but we really love mm -hmm. that we, that our church collectively has said, this is a problem and we can solve it and let's try to solve it in our county. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's a realistic, honest, ambitious goal. And I love that. You know, I love that. And I love what you said. It's not like we can go, you know, mm -hmm. and fix every problem there ever is in society, but we sure as heck could fix one or two, you know, <laughs> and, and, and if the church down the street also concentrates on one or two, not the same ones and the church across the street from them, you know, we could solve some problems as a church. We could so solve some societal problems. And I think we could win back, um, some people to church, um, and to Jesus. If we could change their mind on what we're about as a church. That concludes 14 episode 14 of our show. Uh, thank you, especially those people out there who've listened to every hour AKA of us talking. Us. You people are saints <laughs> and awesome people and incredible. <laughs> and there's, there's a couple out there though. Yeah, yeah, Dude, yeah, there's yeah, some yeah. randos who like know better than us, you know, like what we talk about. Like people come up and say, yeah, yeah. And they, they start engaging with me in a conversation. About. Like, and they're, <laughs> they're referring back to the episode like six. And I'm like, I'm not sure what yeah, I said. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I said in episode six. <laughs> um, they know it better than we do. So thank you guys. You, you're awesome. Join us on the Instagram and the Facebook and uh, yeah, just get really on there, that. have the conversation. Uh, we had two, two or three new reviews on iTunes this week, which is incredible. And yeah, we keep getting the five-star reviews and I, we just love that guys. That helps us on the iTunes and helps other people find our podcast. Uh, some randos have contacted us. I am just and said, Hey, is there ways that we can help build this show's, you know, popularity and all that stuff? You know, number one, just listen to it. Number two, if there's something that we say that you like, post it. And number three, just make sure that you're filling out these reviews. Um, not, don't just give us a five-star review, but give us a review, you know, like people want to hear in your words why this thing is helpful for you. So I'm, I, I'm so, so, so stoked that this conversation just doesn't end with me and me and you, Sonny. I think it goes out throughout the week and that makes me happy, happy, happy. No, I'm good. Man. Sonny, you got anything else you want to say uh, in closing to episode 14? <laughs> Do the worst. Oh man. You know, uh, I, you know, you're the one who coaches me. You say, you know, you need to ask me at the end of the episodes if I have anything else to say. And the last three weeks. three weeks I've asked you, do you have anything more to say? No, nope, nothing. It's like, come on, man.
You're making you're making me swim here, man. You're making me just have to sit here and swim. And I am sorry for the dinging in this episode, people. I cannot get it shut off on my MacBook to stop dinging. I shut it off on my phone. I shut it off on my iPad. But my MacBook will not shut off the ding. So I'm sorry. I even closed out of messages, but there's still a ding. I don't know what to do. Else to do. That's a good way to end the episode. I hate the dinging. Thank you for listening to the Friendship Focal Podcast. Don't believe anything my dad.